Welcome to the Avalon Institute Wired to Lead podcast with your hosts Cameron Gott and Perry Smith. The Avalon Institute is on a mission to understand how individuals, teams, and leaders connect with others and the strategies they deploy to achieve the highest levels of success. Before each show, our guests take the Avalon Institute's Cognitive Peak Profile, available on our website at www.avalonleadership.com, and we discuss their unique cognitive leadership strengths. Thanks again for joining us, and here are your hosts, Cameron Gott and Perry Smith. And we want to welcome everybody again to the Wire to Lead podcast. I am here with co-host Cameron Gott, and we have a special guest today who is Aaron Mattias, the Associate Director of Lehigh University um, Leadership Development Office. Aaron has been doing a great job. Uh, and to qualify, Aaron is actually, again, an Avalon teammate of ours, um, who is very well versed in the discussion we'll be having today around uh, the cognitive peak profile assessment and cognitive preferences. So to give a little bit of uh, context around that, the, at Avalon, uh, we have an array of assessments. One that we're very keen on here, again, is this cognitive peak profile. Uh, what we'll be talking to Aaron about today, we'll be, we'll be covering a little bit of ground in the assessment. It does cover other areas, but essentially what we'll be talking to Aaron about uh, will be how her brain activates in the following two realms. Associative preference, which is associated with thinking fast or intuitive thinking, and then systems thinking, her sequential preference. Now, here's the interesting thing about Erin. And Erin, I'm, I'm just going to forge ahead here. Erin <laughs> is a dual processor. Now, I, as a host and a member of Avalon as well, am a dual processor, or what we say, balanced access, having balanced access to both the associative and sequential realms. Last week, for anyone who listened to our broadcast last week, we did talk to uh, another Avalon teammate of ours, Chris Lum, and Chris shows up as being more sequentially preference. So he, his brain really activates uh, more for sequential preference. He is a systems thinker, um, and he actually got into some pretty interesting background. Uh, if you wanted to check back uh, on that webcast, uh, that podcast, you can listen to a little bit more of that. But what we'll do is, here's a little context, and then I'm going to turn it over to Cam, and we'll start talking with Erin, uh, who is, uh, who is, you're going to find to be very interesting in terms of how she processes um, information. Um, as, as we know, most of us seem to favor one system as a default processor. And as I mentioned, the majority of us, actually in the studies behind this particular instrument, uh, showed up as a sequential preference. Uh, a very sizable number showed up as associative preference, and then again, the other uh, four-ish percent uh, show up as balanced access. That means they can access or easily access uh, both systems and appear not to favor one or the other. So interestingly enough, when we talk about associative and sequential preference, uh, we also talk about how that relates to action. And sequential preference, Associated preference, balanced access, everyone has a unique set of organizational skills. Um, it's interesting because in, in balanced access, and we'll be talking specifically again to you, Aaron, about this, balanced access, there seems to be a need to understand the whys of an action plan, of a problem, of a um, uh, uh, some, some, whatever it is you're working on, uh, it, it might be a, a business issue. And you also need to understand the how. So if you don't have balance, uh, we find that that can become a little bit complicated because sometimes we, we definitely need uh, to have that because we are balanced processors. But with that in mind, let me shift this over to Cam. Cam is uh, uh, also an Avalon teammate. Uh, as we mentioned, Cam has a very interesting um, uh, take on this because He's been working with a lot of uh, folks who have balanced access in terms of how their brain activates for information um, in his practice. And Cam, I'm going to shift it over to you and have you talk a little bit about, um, about your practice and, and what you see with balanced access uh, thinkers. Sure. So uh, thanks, Perry. And thanks, Aaron, for joining us today on the Wired to Lead podcast. Um, I work with creative leaders who um, can be sort of creative in thought, uh, creative in vision. 
and uh, but be challenged to get things to the finish line. Um, and so I typically see uh, individuals who may have a child who's diagnosed with ADD and they say, hey, that sounds a lot like me. And so um, they, they come and work with me around follow through and uh, getting things done. And um, if they weren't challenged to get things done and be productive, uh, they wouldn't call me. Right? So there's a real specific challenge. And with, uh, with balanced uh, access or, or dual processor folks, um, it, it can, uh, the, the, the associative and the sequential can, can have this sort of dissonance uh, occurring where they're kind of uh, playing off each other, right? It's almost like two courtrooms, uh, excuse me, two uh, lawyers in a courtroom and there's the why lawyer and there's the how lawyer and they'll sort of play off and uh, argue, right? Well, why are we doing this? What's compelling? And the other one, it doesn't really register for the sequential. It's like, uh, you know, where's the evidence? Uh, what are the steps? And we really need to strive for this goal. Um, and so that's one way. The other is where um, if you're in a room of, uh, of one uh, preference, say you're in a room of associatives, a, a uh, balanced access will hold the opposite. They're going to go to the other side and kind of, well, wait a second. You know, I'm hearing all this uh, why talk. What about the how? Um, conversely, they can do the, this, the exact same thing with a room full of sequentials. Right? If, uh, if you've got um, people who are deep in process and they're really down in the, say, weeds of process, um, they want to go to the big picture. They want to look at you know, well, wait a sec, what, what, what are we striving for? Um, and back to that, those why questions. Uh, both are, are valuable uh, areas. And for the balanced access, Perry, it's that knowledge that this is going on. It, can, it sometimes feels like a split personality. It's like there's two people in the room. I know that might resonate. I'm a, oh, it I'm didn't a, resonate at all, Cam. I, I'm sorry. I oh, I'm sorry. It doesn't? It doesn't resonate? <laughs> Um, uh, no, it does. <laughs> yeah. So, so having this knowledge, I, I've, I found that um, my high associatives or the, the, uh, the associative preferent, they're kind of like, uh, what's the big deal uh, about the knowing this um, at first, right? For, for the balanced access, when they take the CPP and they sort of, they get this information that they have this balanced access or dual processor at work, it kind of hits them between the eyes pretty hard. Like, wow, that explains so much. So that's my take on it. I second that. Um, and, and while we're talking here, Cam, I'm, I'm just going to pull up a, a quick graphic for anybody watching this on video, just so you have an idea um, of where Aaron's preferences, uh, preference come in, comes in. It's not a split 50-50, but I'll pull this graphic up here and you can take a look at this. So Aaron, I know you're dialing in here. I'm, we're looking at uh, at your scoring just as a pie chart, and the way that, that we're seeing it is there is a slight differential between the sequential processing for you at 54%, uh, and then 46 comes in at the associative. Um, as we know, there is that that uh, that gray area there of about uh, 10 point skew. So. I think I actually, I think I'm, if I, I don't have my scores directly in front of me, Perry, but I think I'm actually um, associative preferential. I'm, I'm pretty evenly uh, balanced between the two. I'm not a total 50-50, but I right. think I'm uh, associative in nature, and then I definitely have the balancing. So, uh, Cam, when you were speaking about kind of the, the feeling of a dual personality, that definitely resonated with me. Um, I tend to be the one in the room um, that people think of as kind of the debater. Um, so also the image of two lawyers in a courtroom. Um, I always joke around that I would have been a good lawyer um, because I always seem to be the one that's kind of poking and prodding um, with whatever is missing. Um, but I could never really put my finger on why in some situations it was kind of the nuts and bolts in the organization. Um, and then in other ones, I could get these really big ideas um, and just kind of uh, make these attachments or these associations really um, between more disparate ideas. Um, and so filling out a survey or um, sometimes when people ask, well, are you really organized? Well, for me, it really depends on the situation and it depends on the people I'm around and it depends on the task at hand. 
Um, and so I always never really knew how to answer that question. Um, and it made me feel like, okay, I don't have a handle on these skills that I know I'm capable of, but I almost didn't know or have control as to when they were going to come out. Um, or I didn't feel like I did. So it, it was very eye-opening. Like you said, it kind of smacked me between the eyes when I got my, my report back, my scores back, um, and started learning more about the dual processing, the, the way that, that your brain functions um, in that manner and in those different situations. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that does make a lot of sense. And, and it's given me a lot more um, awareness about how I feel like I can activate uh, one side or the other, or when I'm playing into one side uh, versus the other, um, and try to flip that a little bit. If right. So that that uh, score that Perry put up is the, the um, indicative of of your experience, right? A little bit. It's weighted mm -hmm. more on the associative than the sequential. Um, mm -hmm. So this wired lead podcast is all about leadership, and can you speak a little bit just to? Um, the initiatives that you're you're working on now regarding leadership, uh, Aaron. Just a little bit of background about yourself, um, and and really talk about um, the what. Right? What 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 are you taking part in, where you're getting a chance to influence others? Yeah. Um, so I uh, graduated from the University of Maryland, where I was a uh, track and field and cross country. Um, student athlete there with a degree in animal science and then went on worked for some nonprofits and also was coaching on the side some swim teams actually because I swam all through high school um, and found my way to Lehigh University about six years ago um, where I spent time as the assistant swim coach uh, for the last six seasons and then this past July um, during that time as the assistant swim coach um, worked with my own group but also was very involved um, Lehigh has one of the most comprehensive leadership development programs for their student athletes um, in the entire country. And so really wanted to um, get involved with that initiative, see what our student athletes were learning, um, how I could help reinforce uh, some of that messaging about self-leadership and leading on teams and team dynamics. Um, and then also for my own personal growth, I think that um, any message or any lesson uh, can be applied over and over at different phases of your life. Um, so really, it was also a professional development opportunity for myself. Um, and then this past summer, um, actually transitioned into a full-time role um, working in those leadership programs that we have. So we offer, um, like I said, comprehensive formalized training to all of our student athletes. So we do that in a, in a variety of ways through workshops, team consulting, um, and also kind of organizational leadership, um, kind of like student clubs and organizations. And um, so I kind of help out coordinating, developing content, running um, running, executing, facilitating all of those initiatives um, with our student athletes. And we also work with our coaches as well. Um, so I think that how I have been able to use um, my unique preferences, um, I am somebody that very much believes that leadership is incredibly personal. Um, and I think that everyone has a different way of thinking and doing things. Um, and that's the, the strength of the team that comes to the table. And I think that a lot of times, um, there's a lot of this talk about how kids are so self-focused now, or um, especially college kids, right? Very self-focused generation, the millennial generation. Um, so how could they possibly get onto a team where they can um, all get together? And I don't think it has to be a one or the other thing. I think that all of those unique preferences and all of those unique styles and all of those unique strengths and weaknesses um, come together to make a more dynamic, more comprehensive team. And so that's really what um, I try to communicate in, in um, the workshops that we do, in the conversations that I have, and really enhancing uh, the uniqueness of each person and still following in the standards of what they've said they want to achieve, you know, the things that... Um, they want to accomplish in their, in their season, but also in their four-year time uh, here at school. Hey, Aaron, let me, let me jump in on that a little bit because I, I, I want to provide uh, any listener out there uh, or anyone watching the video with a little bit of context as well with our work at Avalon. Um, we have been doing uh, some work in cognitive preferences and team building also with the U.S. Special Forces. The there's, there's a very specific breakdown for, in terms of the people that we work with within the Special Forces universe. They are either very high associatives, i.e. dot connectors, or they're dual processors. Mm -hmm. Dual processors seem to function very well in uh, an environment um, 
that has a lot of gray area. They can understand the whys of the mission and they understand how to implement the mission. What you described there about connectedness is the language that is used um, you know, within the uh, various branches of special forces as well. We accept people uh, for who they are, what they are. They can certainly get better. They can develop aptitudes, but we'll, we'll find a way to make it inclusive. We'll find a way to connect uh, because the mission, the, the why is incredibly important and they do such uh, incredibly significant um, work um, and, and you know, in, in everything they do for us as Americans. But going back to that whole inclusivity thing, I think that what you're really talking about here is you're talking about how, how you're, you're reflecting that in your dual processing. Because mm-hmm. we feel that we should be able to connect with people. If, if we don't connect on the associative side, we'll find a way to connect a little bit and say, hey, let me just show you what's missing. Uh, right. so that's, that's really interesting. Um, and and I, maybe, maybe what we should do is talk about that, this notion about connectivity, uh, uh, what's missing, and, and how does that manifest itself in terms of your coaching? And are people receiving the message? I mean, is, is it, uh, you know, what are you seeing among the younger people? Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting that you bring up Special Force. I know we've done work with them um, as as an Avalon group. Um, I was actually at a conference a few weeks ago, and we were speaking with the representatives from the NCAA, and we were kind of talking about the similarity between um, the military and um, NCAA level athletes. So obviously, there's a much greater mission at hand. Um, like have the utmost respect for our military members. Um, But kind of one of the core things is that they have to be at the absolute peak of their physical readiness at any given time, right? So the same Mm -hmm. thing with a college athlete, you're trying to get at a peak physical preparedness. um, And you're also putting them in uh, these very task oriented situations. So a specific practice or a specific set or a specific game. Um, and you're trying to get uh, all of these unique personalities as also, as you mentioned, um, together for that common task or that common mission. Um, and I, it was interesting because I had never, you know, for our work with Avalon and, and coming from uh, some of my family have been involved in the military and, and being involved in athletics my entire life. I had never really um, made that type of connection. Um, you see similarities. There's a lot of uh, kind of on the battlefield kind of uh, talk in athletic circles, but I had never made that connection that it's really the same type of population and you're vying for the same people, 18 to 24, you know, like, so it was just a really interesting, um, an interesting thing to think about. And I think that um, in terms of the dual processing, I think that exactly what you said is, is looking for the thing that's missing. So, um, I really have always tried with my workouts or even in recruiting, um, looking for how this person can come in and enhance the diversity of thought that we have on the team and also the, also the diversity of skill. Um, where can this uh, person really be uh, kind of the fit to put us over the edge or get the extra point here or there? Um, and it can sometimes seem so obvious to me um, that – like, oh, all we need to do is get your hand speed up or, oh, uh, we need to do more uh, aerobic conditioning. Um, and it's the thing that's missing. You can see it evidently in a race, um, but that's not as intuitive to others um, as I had always thought. And, and so um, I constantly like, how did you even see that? Or how did you hear that? Yeah, that gets um, frustrating, and, right? <laughs> yes, it can be. Um, but over, over time, I used to be a lot more frustrated with it. it it's definitely something that I've dealt with my whole life. Um, and I, I think in college, it was very diff- in high school and in college, it was very difficult for me because um, I just knew that something was right or I knew that this was the way it had to be done. Um, and it was more um, we haven't even broached onto the our I mortal domains, which are the ways that we take in information from the outside world. Um, mm. But I'm high in my observer, in my listener, in my mover. So I'm constantly uh, scanning the environment and taking in information. And I think when I was younger, I didn't realize. Uh, I didn't realize that. And so I was taking in all this information and making what I thought were instinctive decisions. Um, but really my body and my mind um, was informed about my environment and what needed to happen. So what I thought was intuition, maybe in some ways it is, I'm still not totally sold that it's <laughs> that there's no gut reactions, uh, but it was very much informed by the information that I was constantly receiving from my environment um, and from other situations that I had been in. Um, So as I've gotten older, I've started to recognize that um, the way that I see things or the way that I think about things is not innate or it might not be intuitive 
to others. And so um, I have a, I think of it as kind of my toolkit and depending on the person that I'm working with um, in very early interactions and, and then also as you get to know them better, um, you start by identifying what are some things that I can relate with them on. I start with connectedness. Like you said, I think that you find the places that um, you guys can match up. You know, how is the best way to communicate with you? Um, and then you can start to get into the what's missing and how we need to move forward. Um, and that's going to look different for every kid um, and for every coach and for every uh, situation or team that we're going against or as a large group as well. Um, and so kind of going into do we need to get more energy or enthusiasm? Do we need to pull in more examples of what that looks like? Or do we need to go back to nuts and bolts and say this is exactly the drill progression. I'm going to teach it to you in this way um, and then we'll apply it. And I try in my coaching to do both because I have a pool full of kids um, and now a, a department full of kids that um, learn in all different ways and that have different profiles. And so one thing that I'll say, or something that I'll say one night, I might do it, I might present it in a very sequential way, um, really break it down to the small pieces. And then I'll end by bringing it out big picture and saying, these are some other examples of how this could be connected. Let's bring it back to your academics. Let's bring it back to your athletics. Let's bring it back to your social life. Um, and then conversely, I might start with a bigger picture idea, um, like, hey, remember when this happened at practice the other day? Do you see how this could be similar to what you might deal with um, in the future at, at a job, you know, or with your boss, the same situation, the same conversation? Um, so, and then bring it back to the skill. So what do you do? You know, what's the conversation you have? How do you prevent this from happening in the future? How do you prepare um, better? And so it's constantly this in and out um, changing of lenses, push pull, um, and that's that's just been natural for me my whole life. Um, and so I guess that's also my teaching style, um, or it's turned into my teaching and coaching style over the years too. So I've got a question for you, Aaron. And by the way, we're uh, just uh, sitting here listening to your listening to your CPP. You know your profile just play that's out. <laughs> you're you're active talker, active mover. Uh, and, and, I'm walking yeah. in circles right now too no, while I'm no, doing this. Great. So yeah, this, this, that's all. It's all up. good. It's all sure. good. We're just enjoying right. it. I'm sure there are going to be a lot of people out here who are uh, you know listening and saying, "Oh my gosh, the light bulbs are going off right here." I'm I'm going to I'm going to back up to an earlier statement, Cam. I, I want you to jump in. Uh, a future podcast of ours will be around the notion of instincts and intuition. Because we are seeking to redefine instinct and intuition, and you you may you emphasize that. Uh, let's talk about that at a later date, um, and and hold that. <laughs> and we'll circle back to you on that about how we're redefining intuition and instinct, mm -hmm. um, gut feelings. Uh, we're we're seeing that is really very much about brain networks and activation. Uh, so leading with the gut, uh, that's going to be the title of uh, another podcast. Go ahead, Cam. I interrupted you. <laughs> right. Well, no, they just they again, what is the body but an extension of the brain? I mean, in the sense of uh, uh, the whole nervous system running through and so that we have a thought, we have a feeling, and it uh, registers in the body. And then the reverse happens too, right? The body can be an antenna that is picking up stuff and informs the brain and our thinking and our feeling. So uh, yeah, that's a great topic, Perry. Uh, the question I had for you, Aaron, was, again, this... Uh, if you think about sort of before and after uh, taking the CPP, right? So before you, you knew these were, you know, this is the way you work. This is what was natural. And, and, but after just knowing, uh, having this information, um, what's that shift been for you? Just having that and then how you're able to apply it in the field um, specifically around just this knowledge of having this knowledge, um, how are you getting to apply it? Mm -hmm. um, well, for me, definitely, it, it is, it sounds almost cliche and it sounds under, awareness is always underrated, right? Yeah. It's always the first thing that uh, nonprofits put on their list will raise awareness. Um, and it's the most overrated and underrated uh, piece of pretty much anything that, that you're trying to get accomplished in an educational setting. And so, but the awareness really for me has been huge. Um, it just is the knowledge. It was almost like, oh, here's an answer for why I feel stuck in the middle or why um, 
I've, I've joked around before um, at track practice in college, um, whenever everybody else was really low, I'm the person that, it's, it, they used to joke around that I would suck the energy out of them. Like that I would, like, how are you bouncing around right now? It's the last rep of 400s um, and the longest workout of the year. Everybody's dead. Everybody's like eyes on the ground, like about to die. And I'm like, all right, guys, no, we got one more. Like, let's go bouncing off the walls. Um, and then the flip, when everybody's going crazy, um, I'm the, I can be the calm voice in the crowd. Um, and it was, it just didn't make sense because I couldn't, I didn't have any awareness as to why it was happening or when it was going to show up. And right. so having the knowledge, um, has given me actually some control. And again, I'm a bit of a high achiever. Um, so control is a big thing for me. Um, and so it was like, oh, now I can, my awareness allows me to recognize when I'm being maybe too much to one side or the other, um, in, in a practical sense, um, been working obviously with Avalon here for the last year and a half and um, now in my new role do a lot more administrative tasks and, and have been working a lot more remotely um, with different different people and uh, in different time zones and uh, with very different thinking styles and so it's allowed me to recognize when I'm getting frustrated in a meeting um, or in a conversation I have to I can take a step back now and say okay well am I overusing my associative side right now mm -hmm. like let me meet them where they are um, you mentioned our our partner, um, our Avalon partner, Chris Lum, earlier, and you had mentioned that he's very sequential. Um, so in holding balance with him, we work uh, a lot together. We've worked on our millennial um, leadership offerings for Avalon. Um, I'm going to naturally be very associative <laughs> um, around him. And so that can be a very uh, challenging conversation depending on when we how we both enter into the meeting. And so for us, having an agenda, this is going to be a brainstorming meeting or this is going to be um, kind of a nuts and bolts meeting, or we're going to spend 10 minutes here and 10 minutes there. Um, that's given us a lot of ability to plan. Um, and then to recognize if one of us is kind of getting too far onto one side. Um, so, and then we have a language to talk about it as well. Like, you're like, Hey man, like you're really in that sequential side right now. Like, can you jump, <laughs> can you jump, Perfect. can you jump to associations with me for just a minute? And then we'll go back. I promise. Um, so, but it's given us a way to be able to, to communicate about it more effectively. You know, Aaron, I, I love that you said that because because it's it's one thing, and, and uh, a lot of what we talk about is this notion we talked about it last week of metacognition or thinking about your thinking. You do you do not have to be stuck. You know, there was an old saying that was a little bit of a stigma that said, you know, get out of your head or stop thinking. You're mm -hmm. thinking too much, but it's not. It, it's different because when you articulate it, or you're you're simply articulating the process, and and in a way, you you take a step back and you remove the stigma. And you say, listen, I need to go into to high associative here. We need to, quote unquote, brainstorm. Or what's the next step? I need mm -hmm. to go into more of a systems mode of thinking. I need to be a little bit more sequential here. We're kind of missing this. What's the next step? And then how does that follow with the immediate next step? And, and then mm -hmm. in doing so, you're, you're, it's almost like you know, you're molding something out of clay, but you're doing it a lot more efficiently. Would you agree with that, Cam? Or is that, go ahead. Well, I was actually going to jump in quick, not to cut you off, Cam, but that also made me think right away that sometimes my brain, um, it needs to know, like I can feel it needing to know the why, you know, like, and, and somebody that wants to know the how, like, or is trying to work out the how, that it becomes this kind of like big, almost like a hat, like that's just on my head and it, it, I need it off. I need to know the why. And until I can get the why, um, I can't really dive into the how. And so, um, again, going back to the language, like just being able to say that, like, listen, if we could establish the why, I'm going to be much more effective getting into the how with you. Um, and so it's been able to be kind of this, not a peacekeeper, it's not always super aggressive in that same way, but it is, is this mediator. Um, the language and the CPP has become this mediator for sometimes how strong uh, my preferences can play out. And one thing, too, Aaron, to think about, and anybody listening as well, is that dual processors, while they, they may be a little bit more rare, uh, in leadership roles, dual processors can also tend to be the linchpins of organizations, again, because you're, you're able to, to stand on both sides of the equation. And you connect on one side or you shift over to the other side to find what's missing. And so in organizations, the one thing anybody listening, you might think about is, well, who tends to be pretty adaptable? Who, who might do this? Who's the one who might point out uh, the things, again, that, are, that might be missing? 
Any thoughts on that, Kim? Yes, I think the linchpin, I think the, uh, one of the, the, the liabilities of, of just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull in the, the immortal for just a second. If you take a high mover, active mover, and someone who's not aware of their balanced access, um, they can also uh, have a, a result or this uh, manifestation of a c cacophony, right? Because mm -hmm. they will, um, again, show up and give um, leadership, influence, uh, persuade, communicate something in their uh, associative side, and then come back to the same people and be uh, asking them in, in a sequential conversation uh, question right from the mm -hmm. how and it can be um, disorienting mm -hmm. for the individual who is receiving that message and so again back to for the balanced access having this knowledge that you've got these two uh, powerful processors uh, and just awareness of being in either and the, the teammates around you uh, where they are um, mm -hmm. is, is, is really advantageous. You know, when you talk about awareness, it, it is kind of a buzzword, but this, I, this notion of informed awareness, right, mm -hmm. of, of the awareness that really is going to serve you in this moment right now. Um, and so control, I mean, that, that, that sense of control can be very empowering. So. Mm -hmm. So, so one thing also that we can talk about about dual processors is this seems to come up a lot is uh, the notion of time, and we tend to be very aware of time. I uh, I have a running joke with my wife uh, about how I just let let me look around and I can tell you exactly what time it is, and it's it's fairly accurate. <laughs> so now that we have maybe a minute or so to go, because uh, you have to jump <laughs> off here, Aaron. Um, what one one thing that we did talk about here. Uh, before when we were uh, before we were getting ready to jump on the podcast is, is about adaptability and coaching and we we also talked about the the difference between um, in a little bit of a gender based discussion around coaching men versus coaching women um, so so you 're laughing now, so tell us why you 're laughing uh, because because it it, it did uh, we did have some some extra thoughts around this i 'd like to just talk to the audience a little bit about it and, and again related to your dual processor if you will What's yeah, your methodology? Um, I, my methodology is that people are people, and I think that it can be a really easy stereotype to be like, well, those are female leadership characteristics, those are male characteristics um, and I have always I've never really fit um, into those categories. And I don't really, I, I think that there, there might be some validity. I mean, there's been studies and things of that nature, but I just think that you meet people where they are. Um, and I have been part of co-ed teams. I've coached co-ed teams. I've been part of um, single gender teams. And um, I, I think that it's just figuring out how you're going to connect with the people around you. And I think that people use this gendered leadership conversation as a crutch um, to say, well, the girls don't get it, or, well, the girls just can't take tough feedback, or the guys are, you know, they're, they're just too um, aggressive. They want to have too much hype about everything. Well, they're not, you know, they handle their conflict this way. And I, I don't see that, that stereotype. I, I just think it's a stereotype. And I think that it actually shelters the leadership conversation and the ability to develop um, your own unique leadership style. Um, and so, and, and I, I think probably in some ways that that may and probably does come from my dual processing, that adaptability lens. Um, I just always feel like um, if I'm trying to connect with the person, um, and, and, and that doesn't mean, I think that too, that can be a really dangerous, um, people, people can hear me say that and say, okay, well then you're just a chameleon. You don't actually stand for anything. You're just flipping sides uh, whenever you want. Right. Um, and, yep. I, and I don't mean that. Um, I think that you have a set of core values and you have um, a moral code that you kind of live by. Um, but I think that different people in different situations bring out different facets of my personality um, as a coach, as a leader, just as a person. Um, and I think that that's kind of how I think of um, the ability to kind of switch sides. It's not, I'm not uh, jumping from being one person to the other. It's still my brain. It's still my thoughts. It's still my, um, the way that I view my personal integrity and the way that I choose to live my life um, or impact the lives of others. But I, I think that the method in which you can do it um, 
can be more fluid, it can be more adaptable, and it should be if you want to effectively connect with a range of different individuals. Um, and so, I, so when it comes to gendered leadership, I've seen um, girls that lead with really masculine characteristics, and I've seen guys that have been super effective um, with really female relational characteristics. And, and so I think that just by continuing to um, create this othering situation uh, between the genders, we're, we're kind of missing the big picture, uh, that leadership is dynamic, it is adaptable, and it is unique, um, and it can take on so many different um, different flavors um, in every different situation. There's some core tenets to it, absolutely, um, but it's continuously changing, uh, just like people are. And you know, at the end of the day, there's nothing that's going to stay the same or continue. You know, what works in one space might not work, and probably shouldn't work in a different space. There's different things to consider. Right. That's the either or. And, and Aaron, I completely agree with everything you're saying. And, and um, the way that I ha have always looked at it is to say, you know, we, we can go to either end here. We can we can find inclusivity if, if, if you know, we, we look at, you know, Deborah Tannen and her theories around, you know, men being from Mars and women being from Venus or men competing and women uh, uh, wanting to connect. In my mind, uh, again, as a dual processor, it's more about finding, let's find the truth. Let's get the truth around what we're here for and how we're going to get there. And if we acknowledge that, that the quest is to find the truth, then, then we can start rowing in the same direction here. And, and again, it, it might be a little bit of a, this is a different perspective here as a, as a, as a dual processor of balanced access. Um, but but I, I definitely, I, I'm very appreciative of your comments there because it, it, uh, it very much, uh, one of the blind spots could be that, you, well, you don't stand for something because all you're doing is standing in the middle of the seesaw and you're not, you know, you're, you're not either either raised or lowered in one, one particular area. Um, right. And I think that that, like you, you were mentioning, it's kind of that idea of um, instead of the either or kind of thinking, like my brain has always very much uh, thought in a both and. Right. Um, so the, and, and there can be multiple truths. That's the, that's kind of the ugly truth that no one wants to acknowledge. Uh, black or it's white. Like, no, it's not. <laughs> there are sometimes a lot of grays. Sometimes it's black and white and sometimes it's not. Um, but the room can be cold to me, and at that same temperature, it could be warm to you, Terry. Right. And so I think that, um, and that's a truth to each of us, you know, like, so it's just, but the actual temperature is, you know, 67 degrees or whatever it is. Um, but so, you know, what's the truth between it? And then also, how can we accommodate those unique perspectives on that temperature at the same time? Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thanks, uh, Aaron. Thank you so much. Or would you be willing to come back and uh, join us for another Wired to Lead podcast? Of course, I would love to anytime. Well, awesome. we have a lot of uh, other areas to go into. We have to talk about uh, Aaron's very, very intriguing immortal domains. And again, to remind everybody, that's mover, observer, reader, talker, and listener. And uh, and I think you'll see her scores as, uh, as being pretty compelling. But Aaron, thanks again for joining us. We really do appreciate this and, and have a great rest of your day. We'll, uh, we'll be continuing the podcast and doing a wrap up here. Um, but you take care and thanks again. Thanks, Aaron. Perfect. Thanks so much, guys. And thanks all listeners for jumping on too. So have a good one. Thanks. Bye-bye. Take care. Well, Cam, thoughts? A lot well, of thoughts? About three quarters of the energy just left the room. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. And, yeah, uh, I agree with you. I, that that was some pretty pretty interesting information that we just received in a very short amount of time. Yeah, that, that, uh, tell me. We always ask, what has your attention about uh, about some of the things Aaron talked about? Well, I just uh, I appreciate how she's uh, you know, she's not going to be put into a box. You know, not that we're trying to put her in a box, but um, just the language you know, you know, uh, the language she's using, the the wisdom that she has. Um, and um, again, her, her notion of what leadership is, Perry, around adaptability, um, it's dynamic, it's unique, and, and really, you know, keeping an eye on the opportunity, it seems. Um, and then this, this notion of, uh, of connectedness. The, uh, the, the couple of thoughts that I have here is, um, you know, again, the, the, the traps that a balanced access can fall into is this sort of being accused of a chameleon. That's right. Right. And it can feel like, a, like, again, you're in a situation and you, you can sort of see, see um, I think uh, active associatives can do something similar 
where they um, call it rational, uh, um, situational rationalization um, can, can happen with a lot of my clients who are her high associatives. Um, with the balanced access individual, it's uh, really you know, utilizing these two separate, very different systems. Um, and so what she spoke to of this um, having a sense of a moral code or like, grounded in your own principles, um, coming back to what matters, what are we trying to do here, which is so important in any kind of leadership situation. Yeah, that's right. It's, um, it, it's the, the one thing for that, that you find with dual processors, and again, I speak um, completely biased because I am one, is that sometimes uh, that, that frustration the, the difficulty in, in becoming frustrated by a certain situational um, issue or a problem that you're trying to solve is that it's very difficult to articulate it because how, how can you articulate to, to someone that you've just met that there might be a problem, but let me explain why there is a problem. Um, I, I can tell you, and, and this is my own uh, personal study on this, uh, it, trying to understand why I had gravitated toward uh, certain leadership styles. And the example that I use, uh, which I believe uh, did this to my core, um, you know, again, was, um, was you know, certain coaches uh, who, who might have had what, what, you know, one would consider a dual process side. Um, and one person I've always admired uh, as well, uh, and, and I've read everything I could about him, was Abraham Lincoln, because I feel like he was a dual processor. You know, you, you, you have a... a individual in our history, our American history, who, who was able to have very much sway and balance over uh, you know, uh, areas of history that, that, that we think about that, we, that hopefully we'll never have to encounter again. And in the, in the areas being that, you know, he had to unite a country. He had uh, these, these opposites, these polar opposites that were going on around him. He realized that, that he could form a cabinet um, and in forming the cabinet, uh, he found people who didn't agree with one another. Uh, and he was able to actually be that linchpin because he also knew that they had a different skill set or a different set of uh, assets that they were working from. But he was prepared, you know, fully prepared to be able to, to manage all of the, the disparate um, uh, personalities uh, and um, uh, points of view in that cabinet. And at the same time, go even greater. Here it is, and he had a country that was on the verge of being split. He understood in his philosophy, and in, 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 as he developed uh, as a leader, as a president, he wasn't very good at it in the beginning. But he he stayed on top of it and understood that the real core idea was that that ultimately uh, slavery had to be defeated. And on top of that, a huge idea for him as well came was that if if slavery wasn't defeated, then our country would never come together again. And you know, again, he, he never deviated from those core ideas, and he always sought to balance them. And, and in the end, when you had, had the South that, uh, that was on his knees, uh, that surrendered to the North, uh, he, he said, okay, come back into the fold. There were certain restrictions and everything. But, but you know, for him, one, one example, if anybody wants to look at it, which I always point to, is also the Gettysburg Address. You know, in the Gettysburg Address, he, he actually very much articulates, I believe, his dual processing uh, uh, um, it, you know, the way his mind works, because, you know, he, he talks about just the Gettysburg Address, and I think it's 263 words, I'm not sure exactly. Um, but he talks about, this is why we're here. And, and this is what we have to do. It's very simple. <laughs> Here's why we're here. Now we're engaged in a great civil war. This is what we're doing. And this is what it means. Um, so, you know, I, I point to other other folks, and we can talk about it more. Uh, you know, Bill Walsh, um, Help me out here because you know I'm trying to trying to think myself through here. Yep. Uh, a former UCLA coach. Yep. Um, basketball coach, John Wooden. John Wooden. Sorry. So so John Wooden again. He he considered himself. He took he he considered himself. He took a different approach to this camp. He said, "I'm an educator." So he he kind of def redefined himself. Uh, outside of the world of coaching, instead of saying, you know, I'm, I'm just a basketball coach, I'm a coach. He said, I'm an educator. So he gave himself a little bit of a middle ground. And, and John Wooden's approach uh, in handling all of his players, and I believe a huge key to his success, because it was very unique at the time, was he would, he would tell somebody, his players, he would say, this is why we're doing it. 
or he'd say, this is why we're doing it. This is how to do it. Or if he saw a play that didn't quite go the way he wanted it to go, he would call the player over and he would say, I'm going to tell you exactly what happened here. This is why it didn't work. But now I'm going to explain how, you know, or excuse me, the why of why it needs to, to, to work the next time. So he was always bouncing between the hows and the whys or the whys and the hows. And that, he, he developed a dynasty out of that, I believe. Right. And again, it's um, this, uh, you know, so if you think about like, um, we, we still have work to do in leadership, don't we? <laughs> so, so. There, there must be some, we stop talking now. Well, well, but, you know, again, so it's, you know, coming back to the, the challenges in leadership and, and if people have these assets, right, if they have a, a view or as uh, Aaron was saying, awareness, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to pick on balanced access, right? To say no, all leaders, right? But even a balanced access has access to the how and the what, right? Like Abraham Lincoln or um, John Wooden. Uh, but not everyone's an Abraham Lincoln or John Wooden. It's like, what do those guys have uh, that, that others can emulate or pay attention to, to get, right? Like, right, so, so why aren't they, why aren't more people? Um, I know this, uh, the, the Gettysburg Address was certainly something special, right? But that ability to uh, really hit these high marks in these two areas of the, the, the why and the how, right? And do that consistently. That there's, why don't we see more of that? What, what do you think are the forces that get in the way of that? Is it ego? What, what happens there, Perry, do you think? I, that's a very good question. And, and what actually is an associative thought, what comes to mind is I was remembering uh, working with an individual who played Division I football. And um, we mentioned our, our teammate, Chris Lum. This is a different, uh, different guy. And working with him, he showed up as, as very much of a, a sequential um, a preferent thinker. And it just didn't occur to him to explain he had been tapped as a leader, uh, was, was actually a very authoritative leader. Um, and if a plan were put in front of him, he would execute the plan. But the difficulty that he was having uh, was he was rubbing his teammates somewhat the wrong way because for him, the finish of the plan was all he needed. He, he didn't think, it, it just didn't occur to him to, to talk to everybody about, well, this is why we're here. Um, in fact, he, he kind of shied away from that because it just didn't feel comfortable to him. And so we, we drew this out on paper and we put, you know, put a, a couple of columns at the very top and we said, okay, the hows. Well, that column got filled up very quickly about, about the methodology that he might use to approach the situation uh, right. or, 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 you know, some goal. And then we, when we went over to the why section, uh, it took us a while to get there. But what he does now is that's part of the way that, that he is approaching challenges. He literally writes it out on paper and he knows that he'll get that left-hand column filled pretty quickly, but he has to struggle a bit or work a bit harder uh, to fill the Y column. It's, it's like a muscle. You, you warm the muscle up. It's there. Uh, you know, even if we're sequential preference, it, the, the, the associative side is there. It's, it's just a muscle that needs to be worked at you know, before that preposition. Sorry. But, but what, I, what I get to here, Cam, is that, is that we need to, everybody to understand these are aptitudes as well. You know, you, you can develop aptitudes. If you have an awareness, you can develop a specific aptitude toward either getting to the why or the how, if you acknowledge that it might be a challenge, it might be a bit of a blind spot. Uh, and, and developing that self-awareness translates right into the, the notion of, be, of becoming actionable and then developing a strategy for that. Right, right. There was one other thing I wanted to talk about that got my attention, if that's all right. Please. And that was, that was uh, when Aaron was talking about her work with Chris, right? So Chris Lum, who was a sequential preferent, and Aaron, who is, uh, balanced access with a leaning to the associative, right? And, um, and I think the two of them benefited greatly by taking the CPP. Agreed. Because she talks about this language, right? Um, and that 
being able to, to I think there's the, the first, there, there are two really uh, sort of two big impact areas regarding uh, the CPP. It's the recognizing it within yourself, right? So if we want to just sort of move over to uh, EQ, right? That self-awareness, uh, self-management, right? That metacognition of thinking about your thinking and how you move through the world. Just like the example you gave of the football player who recognizes, okay, I've got the how. I really need to just put a little more effort and energy into the why because it's important. It matters. Chris was talking about it last week of he'll come in and he will, you know, if he's bringing that sort of like get it done mentality and not really meeting the people and making it relational, that connection piece that, that uh, Aaron spoke of. Um, the second part about the CPP is this uh, more about the, the dynamic between people, right? As a language right. to understand, you know, uh, you, the two of you spoke of this earlier of this sort of when, when you start to explain something and you might be with a sequential and they're like, I, I don't get it, right? They're, you might be sort of tethering the why, right? Anchoring the why. And, and you're out trying to explain yourself. And, and I've had that situation as a high associative to, you know, my math teachers in the years of like, you know, you got an answer. How did you get the answer? And I can't explain it to them because I can't explain the how, right? But they're right. anchored in the how. Just having this appreciation, again, we heard it with Aaron, is this, it's very disarming, right, to say, oh, there's likely, it's not, not that the CPP is a, you know, cure-all, right? It's not going to cure all that ails you, especially around, you uh, communication and relationships, but I like to call it like the Zamboni, right? That can kind of, it can smooth over the rough spots, right? Because humans, what do humans do? They assume if we don't have information, the brain is going to go make it up. That's right. And so we ask these questions that are not helpful, right? The question of like, why did he just do that, say that, right? Act that way, right? Um, and then we're stuck with that question without asking because we don't want to embarrass them or, right? But we are natural assumers. That's what the human uh, experience is. And so having this information, again, it helps to smooth out things a bit and uh, cuts down on drama, Right? Right. Because again, in, in, you know, in corporate America and organizations all over the world, people are not doing what they say they're going to do, and then they don't communicate it for some reason. Right? They don't have a, a fair agreement or right? they, they can't somehow share what's going on. So kind of a, I like how the CPP and, and Aaron relayed this. Is it's, it kind of cuts to the chase. It gets to, okay, this is how you're showing up. This is how I'm showing up now. How do we work on this and solve problems and move forward? Well, it comes to the chase, assuming that people would, you know, are, are also willing to have a dialogue about it. Because, it, and, and again, I, I think your point is well taken. It, I've, we've talked to a lot of people, and especially in the military, one of the, um, one of the core assessments they, they continue to take is the Myers-Briggs. Well, we've talked about the Myers-Briggs. It's, uh, I would just consider it a bit dated. That's for a different podcast. But they quote, um, scoring from a Myers-Briggs standpoint, well, you can turn around and say, well, I'm introverted well, or, you know, I'm extroverted. Uh, the CPP offers more definition. Uh, we, we know that when, when pe people can actually gravitate toward it and it becomes part of their toolkit. Um, we always talk about it being kind of a Swiss army knife, you know, well, Swiss army knife has a lot of different tools. Which ones do you generally use a lot? Uh, which ones do you pull out pretty readily and which ones kind of stay hidden a little bit? So, so in a way, it, it does offer that language too. One thing I do also want to note before, and, and we may be in the process of winding down, but one thing I also want to talk about too is that uh, for dual processors, Cam, um, you, you always, they're also the type of people that might convey this. I need to, I need to sleep on this because that process of, of bouncing between the associative and sequential, not only can it be very draining, right. uh, it, it is a different uh, a way of approaching it. And there is a time lag there, a time factor. And so you may get, you know, a very high associative uh, who, who might be in a leadership group who, who's pressing, 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 let's find the answer, find the answer, find the answer. 
And for the dual processor, uh, you're sitting in the same meeting and you end up holding your hands up saying, oh my gosh, you know, you, you, you're just so unbalanced here and you're thinking it's all about the why, we've got to convey the why, but you have said nothing about the how. Right. In the meeting, they're thinking about it, they think about it all the way home, they think about it through dinner, and they say, I just need to sleep on this. They wake up and they say, okay, I got it. I, I, I spent some time on it, I slept on it, and I got it. And they're, they're in, are absolutely in the position to then come back with that innovative answer uh, that was missing. And in many, many cases, perhaps coming back uh, with an answer um, that is, is definitely would fit with the previous mode of thinking. So in other words, it's not intrusive saying, you know, I'm just throwing this back at you. It's saying, you know, I slept on this, I thought about it. Let me give you an answer here that, that might actually incorporate both sides. Right. You're satisfying the associative at the same time. You're satisfying the need for the sequential um, and, and time has allowed you to do that. Right. You know, and um, I appreciate you saying that because uh, Aaron kind of alluded to that in the sense of, uh, so there's that awareness, right? Recognition of the dual processor at play. It's the courage to trust it. Yes. Right? The courage and, um, you know, confidence in your own unique strengths, right? Recognizing okay, this guy's over here and the courage to say, Hey, time out. You know what? We're going to, uh, not only, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to sit with this, uh, and we'll get back with you. Right. Recognizing that time and the time to process, right. To, to allow it to go over the other side, um, is a good move. Right. Um, and that's, I think that's the other thing is that people don't trust necessarily their their assets in the moment that's right, right. they can panic and uh, you know or like oh i don't want i don't want to fight you know or i don't i don't need conflict or right there's some, some other uh, agenda is is at work you know so that confidence in their cognitive strength is uh, something that happens as you work with the cpp stuff right as you work with this language and you find people who are interested in it because we've also seen that some people are not interested, right? They're right. not in a, not in a, a, a position to really receive this. Um, so it, it's their loss. Okay. Well, here, here's another idea for you that I think maybe we can talk about just for a few minutes here. And that that's the notion of, you know, a year or so ago, a couple of years ago, you, you kept hearing, um, this very broad based definition of, of, um, how, how, for us to become more efficient or settle ourselves or be more grounded. And that was called mindfulness. Yeah. And mindfulness is, a, again, that's, it's very broad in, in what it covers. Uh, some people, you might associate it with yoga. Uh, you might associate it with meditation. Um, but mindfulness almost became its own brand. Yep. Here's what I think in relation to this dual processing uh, discussion that we have with Aaron and, and what we're talking about now. Uh, uh, a key strategy um, that, that I know you use in your practice is the notion of mindfulness, but, but making it very specific around the practice of reflection. Because, you know, here it is, and we have the internet, and we have, um, you know, the, these, these perceived problems of connection and, and huge amounts of information that are just being dumped in our brains over and over again. And one in a way, it's a synthetic associative universe, in my opinion. And one, you know, for well, one day you might have, you know, hey, we're talking about this topic here, and the internet's just a buzz with something uh, around this this particular thing. And the next thing you know, it's gone. There's nothing else to, or or the next thing is there was another layer that's been added to that to whatever that idea was that was there. But we kind of forgot about the context of what the original idea was. Right. But slowing the process down, and and saying, how could we reflect on the actions? Uh, I want you to talk about that a little bit because I know you have a process around that um, in terms of working with clients. Um, and, and I think it's something that people can plug in almost right away. Um, yeah, there was a, if you go ahead and, uh, and Google HBR and um, reflection, uh, I, I'm trying to remember the author, but I might have to look it up and we can attach it to this podcast. You know, that, that, uh, people recognize that reflection is something that is important, but they think they don't have time to do it. Mm. Uh, reflection is something that activates a completely different uh, system in the brain. 
Um, it's, it's sort of a, it's similar to what happens at night when you sleep and that the brain is doing important connecting at night um, to make sense of your day. This whole notion, I really appreciate you bringing this up because, uh, you know, I, I, I'm in a, in a sense, I'm an attention coach and um, there's so much vying for our attention right now. We talk about the attention economy mm-hmm. that, 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 that there, there are groups, large organizations with lots of money who are looking at ways to get our attention, right? To own some of our bandwidth. And that's not going to stop. That's going to, that's going to keep going. So it's so important for us is, uh, you know, we, we are, <laughs> it's, uh, we're consumers and we are getting um, manipulated uh, any way that they can get information into their information. Um, ultimately, though, that we have control in what we consume. You know, so um, first of all, the, the evidence around reflection is is uh, very impressive. And, and in this HBR uh, article, it was it's really like this minimal amount of reflection each week just produced a tremendous amount of productivity, a minimal right. amount. So this sort of pause and get a strategic pause, especially on the backside of, of uh, engagement. I have this analogy, uh, Perry, and we can, uh, uh, it's my evil Knievel uh, uh, analogy. Right? Evil Knievel, guy who was jumping uh, Caesar's, you know, at Caesar's palace and he's jumping the, the water fountain. Everyone was focused on the water fountain and I'm focused on his, his down ramp. Right, he should, he should have fired his down ramp guy, yeah. right? Because it was a little postage stamp of a thing, you know, that was uh, about maybe 10 feet wide. And you look at his son, Robbie Knievel. Robbie Knievel has a, he's got an awesome down ramp now, right? Because he learned from his dad missing that damn down ramp. Right. The down ramp is where we finish the job, land, and reflect, on the experience and set ourselves up for the next up ramp. And we don't think about that. We often, again, we jump to the next thing. We think we don't have enough time for reflection. You know, the CPP is this great tool to, as a, it's a, it is a tool to use in this moment of reflection, right? You could hear Aaron reflecting all the way through our conversation, right? And the power of that and applying it forward to new opportunities. Right, that's a sign of excellent leadership, right there. Is taking what I'm learning and applying it forward. I, I agree, and and it, you know, also an idea I think behind that as well is is the notion that um, you know here it is, and as a culture, you know, in America, we're we're seen as a you know we move, we move forward. We're told that all the time. Let's move forward. We got to move forward, and you know, and, and we're going to overcome overcome this obstacle or whatever that might be. So the notion of reflection is a little bit of a softer. Uh, I think it has a softer connotation, but, but the reality is, is that sometimes we're just moving forward so fast we forget. There's no, there's no reason not to go back and think about, well, I really did accomplish something in, in a, for the course of a week or a month to go back and really think about those things uh, because that, you know, those, those are also part of your ammunition. Um, and, and even if it's a once a week uh, uh, check-in or something and take a look at your calendar and say, okay, what did I do for the week? I, I would very much, and especially leaders and, and uh, folks in business and, and also folks who are, uh, uh, you know, engaged in athletics, um, you know, thinking along these lines and setting that up as part of a tool belt, uh, can, I believe, can only, only really help the process. Uh, because it also says, well, you know, I, maybe on, on Tuesday, I didn't do quite as much as I wanted to do. Well, why was that? You can think about the why of that. And then next Tuesday, or whatever might be within the schedule, you say, hmm, I didn't quite get there the last time. Um, but if we don't do the things like that, then, then the only thing that it really adds up to is being a bit more or less specific and, and a, perhaps a general feeling of discontent. Because you don't understand, you don't understand where those, uh, those beacons in the road are. Right. You know, and it sort of these gross generalizations of the people that I see. Again, the, the active mover, balanced access individual. Uh, is often what I call a racehorse right? when they come right. to me. They think that speed is going to solve everything, mm-hmm. uh, that they just need to go faster. Uh, they need to get things done quicker. And so the notion of tapping the brakes, right, or to pivot and look back and reflect, 
is really off their radar. Um, so that that can be something that is very powerful for especially a, a dual processor. Right. Yeah. Well, listen, let's go ahead and wrap up. This has been a great, yeah. I think, awesome. a great discussion. Uh, we are very happy to have Aaron uh, on the call. Uh, for anyone who'd like more information on the Avalon Institute, please visit us at www.avalonleadership.com. It is free to join. You just type in a little bit of information, which we really do nothing with. Uh, we'd like people to join the roundtable. We'd like people to be part of this discussion. And we'd like to find uh, interesting solutions and make you part of the process as well. If you'd like to take the Cognitive Peak Performance Survey, you join Avalon, you can set up your own account. Um, you go ahead and, and you, you'll just click on it. You can download it into your own basket. Uh, you, you have access to your results um, almost immediately. It comes in the form of a PDF. Uh, you'll take a look at those results. Uh, if you have further questions on that, you can certainly reach out to us and send a, an email to the Avalon Institute, info at avalonleadership.com. Uh, and we'd love to talk with you about this. Another plug that I will throw in here as well is we have begun to make great inroads uh, in terms of individual leadership structures, but at the same time, looking at the data from organizations and looking at overall team data. And that, that is another very, very compelling application of this work in the, in the cognitive preference uh, uh, of work that we've been doing here, because it really does give a, a, a different, um, almost a cognitive calibration uh, formula for organizations uh, to work with and, and also high performing teams. So once again, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to do our close out here and we thank our producer, uh, Brendan Kalnacki of Kalnacki uh, Media, uh, who's been a great teammate of ours here in the Washington DC area. Cam, as always, it's been a pleasure and we will see you the next time for the Wired to Lead podcast. You guys have a great week and next time we will talk about what has your attention. Take care. Many thanks to our guest today. And if you enjoyed this podcast and want to know more about how you are wired to lead, go to www.avalonleadership.com, where our roundtable is always open. Once again, the assessment is called the Cognitive Peak Profile, and it might actually change your life. For more info on the Avalon Institute and our advisory services and other products, send an email to info at avalonleadership.com. Special thanks to our producer, Brendan Kaunaki of Washington, D.C.-based Kaunaki Media. Please visit his website at www.kaunakimedia.com. Thanks for joining us, and please tune in to our next broadcast, always available on SoundCloud.